morning, everyone, and welcome to the African American Task Force Subcommittee, the Economic Empowerment Subcommittee meeting. I am your chair, Sherry Dorsey Walker, and before we get started, what I'd like to do is take a moment and acknowledge all of the members of the subcommittee and have them introduce themselves. The Economic Empowerment Subcommittee is in conjunction with the African American Task Force. Without further ado, we can get started with our with those who are members of the task force, excuse me, of the subcommittee. Karen Burton, we'll start with Karen Burton. We shall go to Representative Bill Bush. Thank you, Representative. Um, I'm Bill Bush. I am the state representative for the 29th District and the chair of the Economic Development, Banking, Insurance, and Commerce Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Derek Deadweiler. Derek, I like that. Hi, my name is uh, Rick Deadweiler. Uh, I'm a longstanding member of uh, the Delaware Business Community, a native Delawarean and Wilmingtonian. Uh, uh, and again, uh, uh, always interested in, in issues of uh, opportunity uh, uh, as it relates to the, the business uh, community for uh, 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 African Americans uh, in the state. All right. I look forward to a robust discussion tonight. Thank you, sir. Dr. Eunice Guamicia. Good evening, everyone. And sorry, my video is not on. I'm actually driving, I'm having difficulties on my phone. But I am uh, Eunice Guamicia. I am the CEO of eUnity Solutions and a diversity and inclusion strategist. I'm happy to be on again. Thank you. Mr. Clay Hammond. Dr. Brittany Hazard. Hello, everyone. I appreciate our being a part today. Looking forward to the discussion. I am the board chair for Impact Delaware. And um, I just believe that empowerment um, for our economics with our youth is a priority and not just with our youth, but our community. So I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Ms. Jane Hovington. Dr. Melinda Hudson. Louie Victor Morley II. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Uh, my name is Louie. And I run a small energy company here in the state, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kyle Myers. Representative Mike Smith. Charlie Weatherspoon. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, how are you doing, Representative? Uh, I'm an ex Dupiner. Uh, you know, been in Wilmington about 20 some years, working with all the different communities. I'm a serial entrepreneur in finance and marketing, and I'm glad to be a part of this committee. Thank you, sir. Ms. Siobhan White. Good evening, everyone. I'm Siobhan White, Director of the Office of Supplier Diversity, and uh, thank you all for listening, and uh, happy to be here. Thank you. Secretary Saron Cade. Hello, I'm Saron Cade, Secretary of Labor. Uh, formerly, uh, my former role, I served as Director of the Economic Development Office and the Division of Small Business. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you for having me, Representative. Thank you, sir. Dr. Dan Young. Thank you, Representative. Uh, my name is Dan Young. I'm the Director of the Doctor of Business Administration Program at Goldie Beacom College. Uh, former uh, financial advisor, uh, former CEO of Trustees of Color, uh, and serial entrepreneur, uh, always looking forward to uh, conversations about how we can impact our community. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so very much to all of the subcommittee members. They do a, an excellent job, and I'm grateful to be able to call them friend as well as colleagues. Without further ado, if we can have a motion to accept the minutes. So, so do, is there a second? I second. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 
The minutes have been approved. Now we shall go into our robust discussion. Today we shall be discussing what are the top priorities when addressing economic empowerment opportunities for African Americans. And what I would like to do with this particular topic is bring in the, I, I call, he's listed as Derek Deadweiler, but bring in Rick Deadweiler about the opportunities that exist for African Americans in the state of Delaware or don't exist and what we can do around that. I would like to talk, have Representative Bill Bush and Rick Deadweiler help lead this discussion on this evening. Sure. Well, uh, as I saw the, the agenda item uh, raise up, uh, I guess, several days ago, you know, begin to, you know, you, you begin to think about what are the, what are the challenges, but also, you know, look at them from the other, uh, from the other angle. What, 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 quite frankly, are the opportunities? Um, uh, clearly, there are barriers and have been barriers in place, but what are some things that we should be thinking about, even through some of the conversations and discussions that we've had as a part of this uh, economic empowerment uh, uh, subcommittee kind of journey that we've had uh, for the past uh, uh, month or so. So, and I'm looking at it, and, and so as I, I, be, I began to think about this, I thought about the spectrum. Uh, and when we say economic empowerment, you know, you often think, uh, <clears throat> you think job, uh, job creation. We, you hear folks talking about being serial entrepreneurs and having the ability to create or, or generate revenue for yourselves and for your family. But then, you know, you think about the spectrum. So my first thoughts were about the young people. And someone mentioned that a little earlier. Where does uh, financial literary, literacy, economic empowerment, uh, when do we start to teach young people about business? Uh, when do we start to teach them whether it is uh, creating for themselves, earning, uh, 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 understanding the importance and the value of a dollar, um, how to be a consumer, um, uh, uh, you know, at the at a very very early age. So you think about that end of the spectrum, uh, and then you also think about the young worker, uh, the person that's making their first entree or pursuing a first role, whether it be as their first. Uh, 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 their first business or, or possibly even their first job. How prepared are they? Uh, what kind of network or experiences have they had to um, understand how to uh, be a good employee uh, or how, let alone how to run a business, but how to be a good, you know, first time employee. Uh, so we're talking about that journey. Uh, and then at, at the tail end of it, as you're going through your work life, uh, have, you know, is there enough conversation? Is there enough training, opportunity, uh, experience to allow for the appropriate level of career development? Uh, 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 you know, do we know how to do it? You know, do we have the mentorship uh, capacity to support uh, the young professional? Uh, and I was once a young professional. I, I don't wouldn't consider myself that now, but you know, a little more experience is a term I would use. But you know, I think about my experience, and uh, there were a few folks, just a few, uh, that you know were in positions where they could, quite honestly, provide me with counsel uh, uh, and give me the confidence to ask a question about growth uh, in a company that I worked for many years, uh, like Dupont. You know, does I know that, and, and I'm not shy. And, and I was, uh, it was limiting for me, the, the number of people that I had access to that could uh, uh, mentor me and point me in the right direction. So then there's the career development. And uh, then on the tail end, as we, again, keeping the, the theme here of economic empowerment, uh, do we have folks that are prepared and are actually preparing uh, uh, in the African-American community, in, in the Black community for, for retirement? You know, do we think about it? Are we actively engaged in saving, uh, investing, uh, uh, whether it be with, you know, uh, in, in our, our 401k, SIP programs, uh, uh, or, you know, investing in real estate, you know, just, uh, similar to what entrepreneurs might do, uh, uh, development opportunities. Uh, are we preparing for life after a work life? 
And uh, so that's the journey that I thought about that I was kind of looking forward to having some discussion about tonight, where they're, in my view, just looking at, uh, uh, without tapping into detailed data, you know, looking at the, 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 the people around us, uh, our family, our friends, uh, our, our folks in the community, you know, how prepared were they for each one of those steps that I just identified? Um, you know, and, and I think it may be a, a, some cultural barriers uh, that one, we just haven't had the opportunity to, uh, we don't, you know, do we do a, a, an effective job of mentoring one another? Uh, who here on the, the line can point to people, uh, a, a broad range of folks, you know, that provide that type of information Certainly, uh, uh, you know, now we, with, the, with, with, with access to books, literature, information, uh, certainly, you know, you'll start to see folks moving along. But quite honestly, for a generation there, you know, folks didn't have that type of, of access to the information. Uh, so I'll stop there. And that was kind of my thoughts as I saw, you know, what are our priorities? But I also think about what, what, what are the gaps and what would you consider opportunities uh, for us, for African Americans, as you think about the economic empowerment journey. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Detweiler. It was actually very enlightening when you talk about retirement at such a young age. I, I would consider you still to be a young professional because I'm just saying, <laughs> a seasoned I, young professional. How about that? <laughs> yeah, yes. little, yeah, you see that. So yes, yeah, gray hairs. <laughs> But you know, yes. no, but um, but but yeah, there is um, there's something to be said about the journey. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, what does it look like? I spoke a little earlier with Representative Bush, and I, you know, he wanted to talk a little bit about the state procurement process and how that could potentially create economic empowerment opportunities for African Americans. I'll toss it over to him to, so he can share <laughs> some of that process. <laughs> well, I, actually, I think that's that's for a later discussion when we get statistics back. But what I would like to talk about, Sherry, is really kind of, Rick always does such a great job. He always, he does. always does. He always does. But, you know, one of the things I really want to talk about, too, is I think, you know, as a state, one of the things we need to do in our my committee next year, too, is really look at some of the barriers that are out there. And we've talked about some of this before. But, you know, some of it really comes down to, young entrepreneurs being able to get more capital and finding a way to get there. And I think that is really part of the key to getting a lot of these new businesses going is, is Rick really started to address. I think, you know, we have to find more mentors and find an ability to provide these young entrepreneurs out there some guidance to get them to the place where they can actually have access to this money and to move forward. And he talked about workforce training. We need to get these young men and women um, out there so they can have this extra training and to become entrepreneurs. Um, and, and as we've talked about this too, Representative, but I, I just think our business community has a duty too at this point to, to really to find more opportunities for them out there. Um, and we've talked about franchises and other things, and we need to do a good job as state legislators in terms of bringing some of these businesses to Delaware and really trying to get them to create opportunities throughout the state for a lot of our young entrepreneurs that are out there. And, um, and I, I think it's a focus we really need to address next legislative session. Um, I, I mean, with, with state procurement, we, we've talked about this. We need to look at this. And I know the study is being done, uh, but hopefully we can even find more ways to get young entrepreneurs there. And a lot of that comes back to the mentoring and helping them truly appreciate, and we've talked about it, the difficulty of getting in the system, but we need to find a way so we can guide a lot of these entrepreneurs through the system, try to help eliminate some of the barriers there. And I think, I think next year, that's I know I can speak for myself on my committee, it's gonna be a priority of mine, and I know yours too as well, Representative, that we are gonna to try to Absolutely. guide all the businesses in our committee and find ways in order to create these opportunities. But, but I really believe, you know, Rick is right on. I mean, a lot of providing the training, the guidance, the mentoring, and my way is to truly find ways to eliminate the barriers, which I know we'll talk about more through this committee and find ways, but we needed to have that upon us next year to try to help eliminate some of those and to work with our banking industry and some of the loan industry and find ways so we can get some more money um, to a lot of um, entrepreneurs that are out there. So those, those are my thoughts. 
Thank you, Representative. And before I call upon the next individual, I'll, I'll tee it up so he'll know that I'm coming his way. I read an article today about three young men who are members of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. And in order to keep their community from being gentrified, what they ultimately did is they put their money together and they are actually purchasing homes in their community and helping people to become homeowners and just revamping the way that the system is done and putting people, giving people opportunities. And I think that may be one of our top priorities as far as creating economic empowerment opportunities through real estate. So Secretary Cage, you previously served as the Director of Economic Development and now you are the Secretary of the, of the excuse me, the Department of Labor. So what are some of your thoughts about what I just shared and how we can expound upon that and bring that model here to the city of Wilmington? Well, first, Sister Sherry, I want to point out and thank you for mentioning Cap Alpha Psi and leaving out, you know, Mega Psi Phi. Um, you know, I know we got <laughs> but I appreciate you doing that. Doing make, sure he's muted. make sure he's muted. Make sure he's muted. <laughs> oh, he's off mute. <laughs> Ready. We have an alpha on here, too. So, <laughs> so um, what, what I would say is, is, is this um, uh, one, incredibly important to talk about entrepreneurship. Um, incredibly important to talk about entrepreneurship. But um, one thing that we want to think about is that, you know, in order to, for some, a lot of people in order to start their business, they need upfront capital, they need savings. So we have to talk about how do we increase the income line for the vast majority of African Americans, uh, people of color who are, are out there. And the best way to do that is jobs, good jobs, and, 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 and skills. Um, you know, we can't get it. We, we shouldn't like get into a space where we miss um, that component of entrepreneurship starting out. You know, a lot of our entrepreneurs, uh, we, if we read up on them, a lot of them spun out of uh, GM and Chrysler um, and started their own businesses, but they had a really good foundation and a good paying job. So before we start getting into um, even some of the great stuff that we were talking about earlier, financial literacy. It's kind of hard to be financially literate if you don't have any money. Um, so, so how do we improve the skills of folks in the, in, in the workforce? Uh, we can't look at economic development and jobs and skills um, separately from education. So what do I mean by that? If, if everyone in the education sector are looking at uh, uh, African-American test scores and communities of color test scores in math and science, it doesn't end when they graduate. Um, we still have that same deficit, it's just we're no longer counting it or measuring it. Um, and it manifests itself in the job market um, where we experience incredible unemployment and a limited you know, access of you know, minorities who are in positions um, in the sciences. So one of the things that we're looking at right now is the, you know, uh, uh, the number, the percentage of African-Americans who are in industries that are the greatest threat of automation and globalization. And if you look at the numbers, African-American males are in industries that, you know, the clock is ticking on how long those industries are going to be viable um, for the vast majority of the workforce. So we're talking about transportation. We're talking about uh, industries like warehousing. Um, you know, a lot of these are industries that are going to be um, automated out, or you know, uh, uh, technology is going to take the place of the workforce. And these are pretty good-paying jobs. So, how do we help individuals change career tracks? How do we double down on adult education so that we can essentially pick up the pieces that? The education system is kind of left behind and left to us um, so that we can upskill people so that they can be more, increase their value in the job market. Um, and also, you know, how, you know, the, the question should come, how do we encourage businesses to hire uh, these individuals? So one, we talk about state procurement, which is incredibly important because we have to walk, you know, uh, uh, walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, but we also have major corporations in the state 
who uh, in some places that you go, there are mandatory local hiring requirements uh, that exist to ensure that people who live in those communities uh, get access to those jobs. Um, so these are, are so I, I think we, we want to focus on entrepreneurship and that's great, but we have to remain focused on the thing that's going to impact the vast majority of uh, 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 individuals and that's good jobs and having skills that are marketable in the workforce. Um, one thing, last thing and I'll wrap up, um, you know, I did have the pleasure of going around the country and talking to business owners and talking to companies who are thinking about coming to Delaware and to a person, I do not remember a business that I've ever, that I've sat in front of where the first thing that they asked us about was our taxes or incentive programs. The first thing they asked us about was the quality of our workforce, whether or not we had people who could do the jobs that they need us to do. And everything from the big Amazon project to some small uh, company who's, you know, startup, who's, you know, looking to choose where they're going to make their, what they're going to make their home and the skills that they are looking for, they will pay extra taxes if they can get the workforce that can make their company, company profitable. So, so I think that's where we, you know, want to make sure that we keep a focus um, is, is skill development right now in the state of Delaware. You know, we really turn over workforce development to the federal government. Um, the Department of Labor, just to be straight with everybody, and you know, I've made this point before, uh, Department of Labor receives fewer dollars from the state than the state strategic fund does. So, you know, when you have a system where your focus isn't on the development of your greatest asset, which is your people, um, you run into a space where where we are right now. So I'll 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 stop and let someone else uh, pick up, but um, this is something that we gotta stay focused on. Thank you very much for that information, Secretary Kate. And as we think about all that you just shared with us, I'd like to toss it to the gentleman who is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And also he's, create, he's crafting young minds as it pertains to preparing people to be entrepreneurs and preparing people for the workforce. So Dr. Dan Young, can you talk to us a little bit about and expounding on what our priorities need to be and how we create these economic empowerment opportunities for African-Americans? Thank you, Representative Dorsey. And uh, as uh, similar to how uh, Mr. Cade mentioned it, I appreciate the shout out to Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity the first of all black Greek organizations for collegiate men. Thank you. Uh, so, <laughs> I see Saran smiling behind the, uh, the screen there. Uh, so I think, I think both uh, Rick and Saran touched on a number of really good points. Um, from Rick's point, the concept of entrepreneurship and the recirculation of the black dollar, which is ultimately what this is about, uh, is incredibly important. Uh, as we know, 50% um, of all new businesses fail in the first year, 75% fail by year number two. Um, so when we, as, we, as we start to encourage people of color to move towards that track, we have to do that with the understanding that even those that receive funding, 25% um, of them are gonna exist after 24 months. So oftentimes while that's incredibly important, we also have to understand that as an individual entrepreneur, we're still in a system where we're dealing with structural racism and prosperity. Uh, and we deal with everything from, from the real issues of the black community, such as employment discrimination, disparities with the justice system, disparities with health outcomes, disparities with the educational system. And as we've gone through Jim Crow and through residential segregation, um, and even through being targeted for subprime mortgages in, 2000, in 2008, um, we're constantly in a situation where we're, we're trying to play catch up from behind. Uh, and even talking about the re real estate, um, in 1910, you know, 14% of all people of color um, were farmers. Uh, and now to go to 2020, only 2% were farmers. So what does that mean? That means less actual production on land compared to maybe owning a home, which once again, in its own right is wonderful, but we're not using our land for the production of resources that can then be sold to other folks. 
So I do believe clearly, I believe in entrepreneurship, being an entrepreneurship professor. Um, but the focus there um, should be on not just the entrepreneurship, but having multiple businesses working together to recirculate the black dollar. And then um, very similar to what Saran mentioned, um, what, we can't forget about the things that aren't on television, that aren't super sexy all the time. And so some of those focuses that have increased the opportunities for, for people of color have been historically, first of all, the systematic, and these are all policy, you know, the systematic uh, raising of the minimum wage and advocating for this. So the state of Delaware minimum wage is 9.25 an hour, which was increased December of last year. But if you look at the surrounding states, like New Jersey is $11 an hour, Maryland's $11 an hour, New York is 11.80 an hour, and District of Columbia is $15 an hour. We have seen that the increase of the minimum wage has had a disproportionately um, magnified impact on people of color than it has on anyone else. Also something like trying to increase our representation in unions. You know, Saran said it very, very well. At the end of the day, we can't do all this self-actualization from a, a financial perspective if you don't have the money to work with. And every time I go out somewhere in Wilmington, I talk to some of my friends and uh, you know, go to somewhere like the University List Club, which people think are made up of a lot of people with money. Most of these guys are co contractors. Most of these guys are developers. Most of these guys start as plumbers and electrical workers. If I get a, a union job with the, with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, that's six figures, like straight off top. And we aren't spending enough time talking about how union representation gets a certain, um, not only a certain amount of income, but also it gets a certain amount of stability and nothing has led to more generational wealth transfer in this country than oh, this representation and saving and sending those dollars to your children. And last but not least, the obvious thing over the next couple of weeks is increase in voter participation. Um, there's no way you're going to you're going to change any structural barriers unless you have the people that you want in office and advocating for those policies that will directly affect African American people. Uh, and some of those things that that we try to push for are things like uh, same day registration and early voting and an automatic registration that have plagued the black community for so many decades. So I definitely believe in entrepreneurship. Um, I definitely believe that that is, you know, with everything from Shark Tank uh, to TV shows, to pitch competitions, to swim with the sharks, that is what's oftentimes in the paper. But I also want to make sure we don't lose track of the fact where even those entrepreneurs, the 25% that exist over the first two years, um, they are still subject to the structural racism and barriers to prosperity that we as a people have always been. So do not forget about the minimum wage and union representation and voter registration, as those are really the only pieces that might, for a broad scale as a people, really impact our economic opportunities. Thank you, Dr. Young. And we started with the illustrious member of Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated. And if I did not mention that, that would, it would be a whole serious matter. So I just wanted to ensure that I did that shout out for Rick Deadweiler, who I greatly appreciate his comments a little earlier. I would like to hear from Director Siobhan White about her thoughts regarding the top priorities addressing economic empowerment opportunities for African Americans from her perspective in the Office of Supplier and Diversity. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to make it a little bit brief because I have sure. to jump off at 530. Um, but when it comes to, in particular, you said Office of Supply Diversity in my role, um, we have to make sure that the state um, makes African American business owners a priority. I know we have, we know what our priorities are, but they need to know that African Americans provide a great contribution to the state and therefore they can see our value and make sure that the policies and, and processes are in place to make sure that we're uplifted and we have the same opportunities. We're talking about the, our businesses can't get bonding in the construction field, um, access to capital as everyone else before me mentioned. Um, our businesses don't have the capacity 
to handle the type of work that the state is seeking. So we have to make sure that the business is structured correctly, that it's running correctly, that the labor force is there. So just as Secretary Cade said, um, these things have to happen, but they have to see our values in order to make it a priority. Thank you, Director White. Greatly appreciate your contributions. How do we, does it seem like that there are benchmarks that are unattainable as it pertains to black businesses in the state of Delaware from your perspective before you have to jump off? Uh, yes, there are. Um, when you take a look that. at, mm -hmm. well, when you take a look at the procurement as it's set up, um, some of the major agencies, they don't have to, we don't, one, one, one thing I wanna say, we don't have any set goals. But one of the things that we do have is we have this um, under threshold spin. And a lot of uh, the black dollars are there, but that's discretionary spin. And so we have to make sure that they're using the list, they're using African-Americans who are certified in this, African-American businesses that are certified in the state um, and make sure that they are able to uh, get that dollar. So for one of the categories um, in the under threshold, they have to have three quotes. Well, the rule states they're supposed to be using the list to get a quote from a business that's certified. Um, that's a great ask, but that is not a requirement. So it's little things like that, that kind of keep our business owners back. And when you talk about the central contracting, um, a lot of that, you know, there, we don't have a lot of primes in the state. It's subcontracting. And then within that, they're using that to get, oh, maybe they can get a score, 10 points on their RFP for using a diverse business. Well, I mean, that's, 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 that's crumbs. You can't get full off of crumbs. So we need to have an overhaul, a legislative overhaul within our state procurement process. Thank you, Director White. So I believe that Representative Bush and I have our marching orders going forward into General Assembly session 151, the 50, 151st General Assembly and session. And yes, Representative, sir. Representative Saran, I also yes, want to just piggy piggyback on one of the things that um, Siobhan mentioned. Um, we also need to, make sure, need to make sure that on procurement that we're clear as to what minority group we're talking about. Um, I've had some really deep conversations with contractors in our state. And the way that it has been designed is that everyone is a minority except for white men. So you have a lot of, you know, white male contractors who will have their daughter spin out another business or their wife spin out another business and they get classified as a minority contractor in the way that we define minority contractors. So even when they are bringing on minority contractors, it is not the, the minority businesses that we're talking about, the disadvantaged businesses that we're talking about. Um, and so, you know, we have to be very intentional and specific as to what we uh, want. And, and many of them will tell you like, look, I, I would hire, but you know, this is allowed under the rules. So, you know, why not keep it in my family? Um, and so, so, you know, we, again, we, we just have to be very intentional with the way that we, 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 we do this if we do, if we go down that route. Thank you very much for those comments, Secretary Kay, because that is part and parcel of the problem, especially in this state. I was actually dealing with a business owner and he said, well, if I put the business in my wife's name, then I'll be considered a minority contractor. So I'm glad you brought those, those points to light. Is there anyone else among the subcommittee members who would like to share your thoughts around what our top priorities need to be as it pertains to addressing economic empowerment opportunities for African Americans? Before we open it up to the community for questions. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Sorry, we had two people speaking. Sorry, I'm I was gonna, yeah. Okay, this is this oh, is Luby. Yes. Yeah, I was just gonna add, um, especially now that we're in COVID, uh, with the situation that I'm personally dealing with, the funding that's available now, um, 
you can you guys can add that to the list as a priority to ensure that they do go to minority businesses as well and they're not just kicked out of the process. That funds are allotted to African American businesses, or black businesses. Okay. Correct. Because it's not just me. I spoke with a few other people, and about three of us, um, we're all the Delaware-based business, and we're having issues. You know, when we clearly meet the criteria. So, I just if you could add that to the list, that's something companies need now to survive for the future. What kind of issues are you having? that we could potentially work as a subcommittee collectively to help you address? Right now the state has a relief grant out there and that's supposed to be for Delaware-based business. And I know of three Delaware-based business that were not awarded the grant that clearly meets the requirement, so. Okay. Um, I do, before I jump off, I do wanna to speak to that. Um, so initially when the Delaware Relief Grant Program was announced, there was a priority to make sure that the word got out to Af African-American business or minority businesses um, because of what happened with the PPP program. Um, a lot of our businesses didn't even hear about PPP until it was too late and the money for the first round at least had already run out. So when the $100 million grant fund was announced, there was a set aside for the minority business community of $15 million. And so we patted ourselves on the back because the numbers for the first round of the applicants, they looked great. I mean, we had 50% you know, either minority or woman owned business apply for the grant. When it came down to actually approving for the grant and giving out the money, the number was significantly lower. And so what we found was that it was just small little things, the business license, the taxes weren't in order, some of the, the documents that they needed were just not together. And so now there's been an outreach specifically to those businesses to say, hey, you know, we need an updated business license, or you know, you need this extra, we need the whole tax document, not just you know, the first five pages. We need the complete tax document. So that outreach is being done. And what's, what's funny about that is if we didn't take that, sit down and take a look at that, that's something that we would have never even known because from what I didn't know is that the portal, they don't tell you why your application was denied initially. So we have the business managers calling out all the business, calling the business owners to say, hey, these are the documents that you need to submit. So we can get you approved so we can get you some money. So it took a little bit of trial and error and I would say some pushing, but um, we recognize the need and try to, make, try to make the process work for our businesses. Not to say that it's a perfect, you know, perfect process, but I think, I think the key here is having somebody to say, hey, maybe you need to look at this and come up with another way to get the money to these businesses. So we have to have these processes and we also have to have people in the room who actually want to work for African-American business owners. Thank you, Director White. That is pertinent information for this conversation, for this robust conversation. And I'm glad that your office and any other offices are doing that outreach that's necessary to ensure that black businesses can in fact get access to those dollars. Black and brown businesses can get access to those dollars. Dr. Brittany Hazard has her hand raised. Hi, Representative. Um, thank Hello, you for the opportunity. And it's nice to see everyone on the call with such a wealth of information. And I just wanted to jump back real quick. Um, very early on when Mr. Detweiler started, um, he, he, he touched on youth. And that was the area that I kind of just spoke very briefly on when I did my introduction. And what we have to be mindful of is that we have to provide a balance to supporting the current concerns and supporting the development of our young people so that we don't have these concerns five, 10, 15 years from now. You know, we don't wanna to continue to hear, oh, they weren't educated, why didn't they know? They didn't have mentors. And so, and speaking to that, I know along with, um, as the chair 
of Impact Delaware, you know, we consistently have a mentor and programs that are going on. What I would like to see though, something that is um, consistently um, some sort of curriculum or support or even um, business owners who, who are um, available to come and speak to or provide information to these young people who are of color who are already getting life skills, but provide that financial literacy. And the reason why I say an individual is because what we have to understand with my background being mental health, primarily, we understand that individuals, most of the time they learn based upon relationship and engagement. And our kids want to see it. You know, <laughs> they have a lot of different outlooks, but talk is not a lot to them. They want to see it. They want to experience it. And so, um, for example, currently our Man Up program is doing a virtual um, mentoring um, group. And last night we had about 10 to 15 um, boys of color from the ages of uh, fifth grade, I'm sorry, to about eighth grade. And the mentor who's running it, our facilitator right now, he's an alumni of our group, but he's also a young entrepreneur. Um, the great part about it is that he has the background, he gets the buy-in from, from the guys and they seem excited. But when I hear us talking about the current concerns, all I can think about is you don't know what you don't know and you do well at what you do know. And so if we find a way to push the financial literacy in a way that it connects with our specific culture at their age with the generation, then we will begin to see some change later. And one thing that I am I'm very clear on is when you talk about mentorship, a lot of times people think it's like a, you know, a one-time, a couple year process, but those of us who have done it well or have had a, a mentor who have impacted our lives, we know that they, we've been connected for what seems like a lifetime. It's almost like they were with you somehow, some way, every step of the way. And so when we think about connecting young people and helping them understand financial literacy, especially when it has not been a priority in their household, right? That's the role that we will begin to take as a community. And again, as I started, if we have a balance with the current concerns and um, supporting the trajectory of our youth who are coming up as far as educating them um, and teaching them, helping them to learn it as a practice, then over some time, we will be able to see you know, much more growth, um, but it definitely will have to be done um, hand in hand. And so um, with the great minds that we have on our subcommittee, I just wanted to put that, that little plug out for our young people because often, um, often it is looked as if they're not interested. But again, as I said, you don't know what you don't know. And once someone shows you or enlightens you on something and teaches you how to do it, it's possibly that you could light a fire and create even stronger entrepreneurs. So uh, thank you for, for the time. Thank you, Dr. Hazard. I was that was actually quite empowering because our youth are definitely our future. And so we have to sow seeds into them in order to be able to reap the harvest. I see that Dr. G has her hand raised. Can we go to Dr. G, please? Thank you, Representative Sherry. And thank you everyone for such an engaging conversation. I, the sister just took off my words. Dr. G, your audio was kind is going in and out. To add that as we think of our current priorities, we should not forget where we have been and where we're going. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Dr. G, your Can audio you me is it's yes, Dr. G. Can you hear me? Your audio yes, is. I'm here. Can you hear me now? It's a, yes, yes. It was a little muffled there. We can hear you now. Oh, okay, good, great. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity, and thank you everyone for such an engaging conversation. I agree with everything that has been said, and the sister that just went before me, just like you know, said what I really wanted to say. But I wanted to add that as we think about where we're going and the current priorities we want to set going forward in terms of entrepreneurship. I was just sitting and thinking about my story and how I came here as an immigrant. And the first thing that I experienced trying to apply for a job, I was told that I was not good enough because of my accent, because of being a woman as an, and an immigrant. And as I have traveled this journey of life, I have come to learn that 
having a good mindset as an entrepreneurship takes you a long way. So as we talk about creating, you know, entrepreneurship among um, young men and women, we really should think about that mentoring, providing them that education that would help them develop and build a growth mindset so that they can go through the challenges that they're going to face, especially with the structural racism, being African-American and not just be able to give up once they have that one or two year into business. But if we can just wrap them around our arms and give them that mentorship and education that will help them to develop a growth mindset, I think it'll go a long way. Because helping them identify their cultural, um, know their cultural identity as well as their self-identity builds their self-confidence and Dr. G, I think we lost you at the end of your statement. We, the last thing we heard was building self-confidence. Well, I'd just like to state that Dr. G is indeed a great example of what can happen when you're given an opportunity in this state or any place else. She mentioned that she is indeed an immigrant and was be little due to her due to her accent. Well, she has a doctorate degree and she is a phenomenal nurse and she does wonderful work in our community sowing seeds. And so we're grateful for the work that she's doing. Karen Burton, the subcommittee member has her hand raised. Can we go to Karen Burton, please? Good evening, everyone. And I want to thank all of you for your commentary this evening and how it is just broadening our process as we talk through and navigate these waters. And as I listened to everyone, I was just writing down some notes. And I think about, as with anything else in business, you always have tracking and levels of tracking and the tracks that need to be presented. I've heard um, from everyone this afternoon, the track of business development, where we are looking for capital for these entrepreneurs and the startups and the capacity for them to have opportunities in the procurement arena. Then the career development, and under that was youth, youth development and talent development so that we have opportunities, not just for the entrepreneurs and the businesses that we want to build in the African-American community, but so that their workforce development has the talent to be able to deliver. One thing I always share with a lot of individuals in our community is that if everyone wants to be a business owner and an entrepreneur, who's working the business for them? So don't discount your role in your career as what's considered an employee, because even as an employee, you are your own business owner because you represent the talent that you are bringing to that business and your mindset, you, you have the same mindset as a business owner, you just didn't want to take the risk. Because without them, none of the businesses for, uh, for entrepreneurs, African-Americans um, or small businesses would exist without your staff. So when I, when I think about the, um, the price point of payment and the labor law and, and, and how much African-Americans are making per hour and how it changed within the demographics of the tri-state area. Everyone that I know that relocated to Delaware and took the opportunities to relocate here from either New York, from New Jersey and their decisions to invest here in real estate for their home and to, to build, have a home and a community for their children all said because everything was lower in Delaware. So the cost of living for Delaware is much lower than you would see in New York and New Jersey and in Philadelphia. So, and or, I'm, I'm sorry, Pennsylvania. So of course, you know, um, from a standpoint of labor, the statistics will show that um, based upon the geographics where you are um, is based upon how much you will get paid per hour in that price point. From a standpoint of procurement and contracting opportunities, there are opportunities out there to, as what happened, is to train and teach our businesses. Um, we have talked about on previous calls how the capacity for them is not there because they lack operational strength when it comes to their business. So when the opportunities arise, they are not prepared for that opportunity because they're not paying attention to their operations. They need to make sure that their operations is solid 
so that they are truly, truly prepared when opportunities present itself. So it's so wonderful to hear um, Siobhan to reinforce that when she said, you know, from the applicants that were being turned away, we found out the reasons why they were being turned away was because they weren't truly prepared. Now, and more importantly than anything else, we can talk all around this and present um, ideas, the areas that we feel as though that we need to focus in on. But more than anything else, unless legislation is amended to be able to support that, we will continue to be talking until we're blue in the face. But we have to have opportunity, a position for our representatives to be able to present before it something that can be changed that everyone will be in agreement for. And with that said, you have to change some of the language on a procurement end when it comes to minority and specifically say African-Americans. For forever, it's always said that that clause has been a minority business as long as you did what they considered a good faith effort. That language needs to change because a good faith effort means that in good faith, I looked at your list, I saw these businesses, I made a good faith call. It does, there's no follow up to say, well, what else did you do? So I think from that standpoint, having more in that process to ensure that it wasn't just a good faith effort and to just actually remove that language of good faith and make sure that it's a little bit more strong to ensure that opportunities were advanced to African-American business. And once again, I just wanna reiterate, the language needs to change and specifically say that African-Americans need to get a percentage of, and that should be for not just procurement opportunities, but when there's opportunities, whenever any business is receiving any type of federal funding and state funding, they have to make sure that a percentage of their businesses and the private and both public have an opportunity for African-Americans to be a part of it. Thank you, Ms. Burton. After hearing you speak, it's almost like, okay, well, that's pretty much, that pretty much sums up everything. The having the operational strength does matter. We have Dr. Dan Young who has his hand raised. Shall we go to him, please? And, and I'll be brief. Uh, just in hearing Dr. Hazard talk about the importance of mentoring, um, you know, those of us who, who've grown up here in Wilmington and, and, and Rick and I are about the same age. So I think we remember growing up uh, in the 90s and there were a lot of different uh, sources of mentorship, whether it was, you know, Omega Sci-Fi or whether it was Kappas with the Achievers Program, whether it was the Alphas with Project Alpha or the Branding Line Professional Association. And there, there, were, there were lots of people who were out there. I um, mean, they're also the folk, you know, they're also having someone like, you know, Stacey Mobley, you know, at the, at the DuPont Corporation or Josh Martin uh, at Verizon. We, one of the things from a structural perspective, we, we've discussed structural racism, but then we also have to talk about structural advancement. And we know that DuPont um, has, has kind of split into a couple different pieces. We know that MBNA is no longer here. Uh, we know that, you know, for a lot of different businesses, Delaware has just been Kind of a stop, a stop, a stopping place uh, for the corporate responsibility. So we also have to address the decentralization of black power uh, in the state of Delaware. And how do we really address that? Um, that's that's been a major issue as it pertains to mentorship because you knew through MBNA there was going to be you know 15 or 20 brothers that would go and 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 work with the kids. You knew through Wilmington Trust there was gonna be 15 or 20 brothers that was gonna go work with the kids. You know through DuPont that was gonna happen. Um, and we we're kind of that decentralization has really affected us. So uh, you know as a group we have to figure out a way to reach out to those folks who were so influential in the 80s and the 90s, um, have a focus group and say what what have you seen that's changed and have folks who are my age and Rick's age and you know Sharon's Sur you know, younger than we are but that age and say, what, what will it take to get you to become part of this mentoring process uh, to help out in the ways that we're helped? Uh, I'm sure Rick would tell you, and I would tell you that without that mentoring, I wouldn't be where I am today. Without, without those people holding me accountable um, and asking what I was doing you know, through my time at the University of Delaware, I wouldn't be where I am today. So we, we really need to convene some of those groups because we've had, we've had this, we've had 
strong black male mentoring, but as the, as the corporations started to expand and break up and people started to retire, those things went away. So I'm not sure whether we have to replace that uh, with some sort of an online type of interaction, uh, or we just need to kind of rally the troops. But um, when we talk about mentoring, it makes, it makes me sad because I remember growing up and always feeling as though there was a black male, strong black male role model that I could talk to. Um, no matter what, and no matter what class you were socioeconomically, there was someone to, to kind of put their arms around you to help. So I think, I think, you know, we have to kind of go back to the future a bit uh, and, and reach back out to say, how did you do it? Um, and, and what do we need to do to replicate some of those structures that were in place to really have an impact on the young folks? So I thank Dr. Hazard for kind of bringing back those memories. Uh, and, and I think there are, there are ways that we can do that. But we just have to understand where that lack of mentoring comes from now. And it's because of the decentralized nature of business in Delaware as it stands now. Thank you, Dr. Young. Yeah, and, and I'll just expand on uh, uh, Dr. Dan. I'll call you Dr. Dan too. Dr. Dan uh, uh, comments, they're, they're, yeah, while things have changed, and I think the idea of us recognizing and embracing the change, uh, understanding that this next generation of young people are different. They have different uh, exposures. They have different access to information. Uh, uh, they are differently equipped. Uh, and I would even go as far as to say maybe even a little more worldly uh, than we than, than the generation uh, ahead of them. Uh, but then there's some things that do remain constant. You know, there are strong programs that are out there uh, and, and you pointed to a few of them. Um, uh, fame is still there with uh, Don Baker who's doing a great job of kind of transforming and evolving that organization because again, recognizing this generation of young people, it's, it, we, you're evolving. Uh, we had uh, uh, programs like, you know, College Bound that, you know, that during the summer where, you know, those folks that had opportunity to access that, to access that type of program, it, it meant something, it was valuable, it showed them something. Uh, exposure, right? A lot of these programs have a lot to do with exposing them to experiences uh, and, and opportunity and moreover people. Uh, who can help help shape them. Now, the other side to that is, is there, while well, we talked about these really rich programs uh, uh, with solid curriculum and, and maybe even professional folks that came in, you know, you have to think about, you know, where are the, you know, the Hilltop Lutherans where, with J Street, uh, leaders like Hicks Anderson uh, over at People's Settlement. I mean, where, you know, where are those leaders that, you know, have sacrificed to a degree you know, their, their personal, what, what folks might consider success uh, to really pour into the next generation of people to make sure they were either in line, uh, uh, behaving appropriately in the community, or they had access to opportunities that, that would pro provide them with a level of economic su success. That's what we, we might call it, um, uh, not to define, you know, success uh, for folks. So, you know, the, 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 the availability of those types of programs, I think is one thing that, that uh, uh, we need to pay attention to and maybe even do an inventory of sorts. Uh, then we talk about, uh, uh, you know, the access to those types of people that make those types of commitment uh, uh, through programs and organizations at a grassroots level that are making a difference in our communities. And again, back to that youth component. Uh, it's something that's near and dear to my heart and I recognize the difference that it made in, you know, we talked about my access and experience uh, as a young professional, uh, but also knowing that, you know, as a young person, you know, whether it was tough love or just uh, uh, having access to a great educational opportunity or experience is what changed my trajectory as an individual person and really wanting to ensure that others have that same access. Uh, so those are the things that we should be thinking about doing an inventory in our own communities uh, uh, as we as we consider, you know, the next generation of business leader, whether it be entrepreneur and I completely uh, uh, connected to uh, Miss uh, uh, Karen Burton's comments around, you know, uh, being an employee, a high quality employee, a well trained employee with capacity to grow and develop. Uh, those things are extraordinarily important. And I don't want to, uh, 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 you know, uh, downplay 
you know, their importance, uh, as we often talk about the importance of entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, having high quality employees uh, uh, is key. And that also attracts uh, uh, additional success through other businesses who want to secure themselves here. So, so I'm gonna stop there because uh, I could keep going. Dan, I do appreciate and, your comments. Yeah, and Representative, I was gonna say something real quick and because Rick had sure. me thinking about it. You know, in this, you know, Delaware, small, million folks, all that kind of stuff. There's no way that Luvi shouldn't have a contract. What we're doing is the fact that we're not supporting what we have. Yeah. If you got, because I've talked to some of these young, young guys, top guys, they're going out of town to Atlanta and places like that to do their work. We need to surround them with what we yes. have right here and say, be it a march on Washington, whatever, we're going to stand with you. Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure that you get all the nurturing ever you get because they're exhausted. Mm -hmm. They're exhausted about fighting the system. What we have here in this opportunity is that we have a chance to make a dent in the system. And the system isn't just go away. But you know, if you bring the numbers together and you do, you know, what what, what your mom was talking about, you give people the opportunity to say, where's my mistake? What mistake did I make? Because there are gonna be mistakes along the way. I know billionaires who made mistakes all along the way. And somebody from Goldman Sachs said, I got you. Don't worry about that. What we have to do, we have to understand the fact that there are different layers. You have to start almost daycare and you, and you grow to people you want to grow, but the folks you already have, that one, that two, that three, that four, whoever, and, and you know who they are, they need someone to stand with them. They shouldn't walk into that room alone and somebody says, sorry, you know, try again. Someone should tell them, like, this is why you're not getting this. And there's enough information, enough people around the table who can say, look, you need to straighten that out. You need to do this, do that. Because I know them. And at the end of the day, they won't be here because they're exhausted about mm -hmm. the system. They're going to go someplace else because I know folks are already doing it. You know, they're global. They're not in Delaware. They may live in Delaware, but they're not doing anything here because they're being blocked out. And we're not helping them get through that, that maze. And we have to take those folks and make them our North Stars. So Charlie Weatherspoon, I wholeheartedly agree with you that it is unconscionable that we have people of color who should be getting opportunities that aren't getting them. It's actually quite sad. I see Secretary Cade has his hand raised and after his comments, we'll go straight to Dr. Brittany Hazard. So I'll, I'll, I'll just, I don't wanna belabor the point everybody is you know, really making right now, which is a solid one, which is you know why, and I hate to pick on him, Luvi doesn't have a, contract. And, and again, I, I will say that um, the idea that their applications or whatnot are, you know, not as up to par as others is understandable because they haven't been doing a whole lot of business with the state. Um, so, you know, obviously they're, they're you know, not going to be as prepared as someone who constantly does business with the state and has generations of a family owned business that has done business with the state. Uh, they're not going to be where they are. Uh, the reason why no one helps them is because it is not the priority of state government right now. If it were, there would be a benchmark or a goal as to how many of them, of, of these businesses, the state is going to do business with. But since there is no benchmark, them not getting access to these opportunities is seen as par for the course. There is no moral hazard involved in them not getting these uh, uh, opportunity. So if we want to be serious about that happening, we've got to, again, be intentional and say that, you know, these contractors must get X percentage. And what will happen is the contractors will then be incentivized themselves to assist subcontractors to get their businesses up to snuff, because if they don't, they will not be able to get access to those contracts. And that is how you create an ecosystem that helps to get these businesses to where they are. We mentioned Atlanta, but all of that was built on, you know, uh, uh, requirements that were put in place in the '70s. Um, and 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 so, you know, we don't have that in Delaware. It has to be a priority. Um, it has to be benchmark goals so that it incentivizes the marketplace to respond in a manner in which that you know we're we're looking for. I'm totally in support of. 
uh, mentoring. So I hope that my next comment is not seen as being against mentoring at all. I've got had some amazing mentors in my life and uh, they've meant the world uh, to me. Um, but I think that if we go too far down that path, we end up in a place where we're conceding to the idea that the only reason that these young brothers and sisters have not made it is because there's someone who's not there providing them some type of secret sauce information uh, or, or, or network. And while that is part of the, the, the issue, um, the, the, the greater issue is that mom and daddy don't have a job and I don't have a job, that, that a career that I see coming down the line or coming down the pike. And there is no amount of conversation that we're gonna have that's gonna change the fact that I'm gonna be hungry when I go home tonight. Um, and, and there's no amount of information that I can get from a DuPont executive who may show up every once in a while, but that is gonna change the, my, my current living situation. And so it has to be both. Um, we've gotta lean into mentorship opportunities, but also you know, let's not look just to the private industry. There, as Rick said, there's a lot of organizations that are in the community right now. The General Assembly, as Sherry knows, puts out almost $50 million every year in grant and aid. Every single year in grant and aid, $50 million goes out the door. There can be a prioritizing prioritization of programs in the community that focus on these particular issues. So, you know, we have the tools in place, in place but there ha the, the gov state government itself has to be intentional about what we want to, how we want to use those tools. Thank you, Secretary Cade. Dr. Brittany Hazard. Thank you, Representative. And uh, Secretary Cade, I appreciate your, your feedback in the area. And Mr. Weatherspoon, um, I appreciate your, your feedback as well. A quite powerful um, insight from such uh, strong professionals. And the one thing, instead of just keep going over and back and forth, the one thing I did want to mention is that we have to be mindful throughout our state that every county looks different. Um, and so when we're talking about each of these entities, you know, what's happening in Newcastle as compared to the access and opportunities in Sussex is a total different ballgame. I was born and raised here and had to move away to actually see like, oh, well, go to college away at a HBCU to see like, wow, there are a lot of minorities doing great things. Um, and that's just relating to Sussex County. And I say that because a lot of the young people that I interact with or have to mentor have to be exposed to that as well. Um, and so when you talk, my background is social work. And so I hear uh, Secretary Kay loud and clear, but I'm not gonna go down that road because I could stay down there all day when, you're talk when we're talking about equity and needs and um, socioeconomic status. But, but what I will say is, as we make progress in each area that we all have our main focus in, we have to remain mindful that if we don't put a solid quality percentage of our efforts to the upbringing of who is coming uh, behind us or younger than us, then it is gonna be very hard to sustain the work that is happening now. So we talk about a uh, Louvi or the businesses and the contract, the work that's being put in now. If we don't teach business owners or um, young entrepreneurs what this is gonna look like, what this road is gonna look like. Um, I think Mr. Weatherspoon spoke on how having someone, I think he said an example about having someone go with um, the contractor to kind of have their back stand in the gap that that's mentorship and that has nothing that's not even uh, talking about youth that's talking about adults who are in the process who still need that so you know however we want to um, break it down I think that somehow some way we have to keep that as a priority it doesn't mean it has to be number one <clears throat> excuse me but we do need to be consistent because without consistency and you educate someone you can't be sure without the practice of it that they're going to be uh, able to follow through without necessary support. And Mr. Cade hit on a, a huge point when he talked about if what I see in my home takes precedent over what I'm being taught or what I'm experiencing in my home takes precedent over what I'm being taught, which it normally does, then that's what's going to take up most of my focus. So um, I just wanted to be clear when I talk about mentorship, yes, it can be um, 
specific to the area of passion, but it also for me has always been the whole individual. And I know the programs that we that we work with, with Man Up and Impact Delaware, we, we continue to engage and support, but we're not just supporting the individual. We try to support the family dynamic, understand where they are in regards to their mental health, as well as academics and schooling. So it is a lot, and I'm not saying this to put it all out there, um, but I, we have to be mindful of those things. But if we want growth, we have to um, stay prioritized and connect people and young people with resources that are adequate. And so I love Dr. Young and um, Mr. Deadweiler, when you guys were sharing those resources, I'm over here like, wow, I, I can only imagine how amazing that would be for some of our young guys to have that same opportunity uh, down here in Sussex. Thank you. Thank you. It was outstanding, Dr. Hazard. Were there any other questions or concerns from any of the subcommittee members before we go to questions from the public? Ms. Diaz, do we have any anyone from the public who would like to speak? Hi, Representative, this is Valerie McCartan. Thank oh, you. Oh, hello, Ms. Val. How are you? I'm sorry. I'm fine, thank you. And you? I'm doing well, thank you for asking. Do we have anyone who, from the public who would like to speak? To our meeting attendees, good evening. If you would like to provide public comment, please at this time use the raise hand function on Zoom to indicate that you'd like to speak. I will unmute attendees one at a time to speak and each attendee will have two minutes to make their comment. Thank you, Ms. Val. Representative, at this time, we do not have any attendees indicating a desire to speak. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I would like to thank all of the subcommittee members for always doing a job well done. Greatly appreciate the efforts that you're putting into changing the course of the economic empowerment opportunities for the state of Delaware as it pertains to African Americans. And it was interesting to hear about our children, and we know this, but our children will do what they see us do. And thank you, Secretary Cade and Dr. Hazard for that reminder and Ms. Karen Burton for the operational strength statement because it does matter. And Sir Charlie Weatherspoon speaking about mentorship and working with other black businesses and going in the room with them because that does so show strength. And very grateful for Rick Deadweiler and Dr. Dan Young for their comments. And yes, we shall be creating that village so that Louie can in fact get that opportunity that does, that does exist. We just have to make sure that it comes to African-Americans. I'll leave you with this. A little earlier today, I, my two-year-old nephew came to the house and my mother was playing with him with a plastic jar and she started tapping on the jar. And my two-year-old nephew walked over to his mom and did the exact same thing she was doing. And my mother, who was a retired educator said, children will always do what they see you do. And what she ultimately did is turn that into a lesson on how to create music. And then ultimately told him to get a book, and go sit with your Aunt Sherry and read. And that's what we did. So if we teach our children to fish, they will ultimately do what needs to be done to create the village in our community so that everyone can eat. I thank you very much for your time today and may God bless you. Thank you, sir.